everyone. Last week, we began the story of Varrock Sorfang, where we talked about the formation of the Hordes, the invasion of Azeroth, his time dealing with the ghost of the past, and of course, the massive loss that he faced while in Northrend, losing his son to the Lich King. Garrosh Hellscream was appointed Warchief of the Hordes, and although it first seemed like he took Saurfang's lessons to heart, he changed rather quickly with Mr. Pandaria, where he first tossed Krumgar off a cliff for bombing innocents, children even, and forsakening his honor. With Mist, he seems to have forgotten about all of that, as he now too drops a mana bomb of Fedamor, and even uses his dark shamans to twist the elements. Elements still healing from the events of the Cataclysm, and slowly but surely, the Horde realized that something had to be done. As we went further through Pandaria, Vol'jin eventually figured out that Garrosh was planning to use the power of the Mogu to shape flesh and build warriors. Playing God and making monsters, this is not what the Horde is about, the troll believes, but speaking out has the other orcs slice his throat. He would spend some time healing and recovering to eventually return and lead the Darkspear Rebellion, the Horde rising up against the Warchief, and while some orcs like Nuskreen believed that the will of the Warchief was absolute, other orcs did not agree. For all himself, Eevee came back to deal with the mess that he'd left behind. After Vol'jin's return, he teams up with Saurfang to infiltrate Orgrimmar, while the rest of the forces, they quickly follow. At the gates, they're stopped by Korkron troops, but Nazgrim is kind enough to send them away and he lets them in. He of course has a lot of respect for Thrall and Saurfang, but he's still unwilling to break his oath to the war chief. We're forced to take Nazgrim down as we siege Orgrimmar, and in the rough hewn passage, on the way to the Paragons of the Cluxy, we meet up with Saurfang, who's been kicking some serious buck butts. Ah, more of Vol'jin's revolutionaries. <coughs> You've made it. Have you found Thrall? <coughs> I am badly hurt. He insisted on going ahead alone. Tell me, how goes the battle up above? What of Nazgrim? Speak to me. Ah, oh, Nazgrim. A great leader and a fine warrior. He valued his oath to the war chief more than his life. I tried to tell him. To tell him that Hellscream betrayed us. Cast aside a war chief's responsibility to his own people. But Nazgrim. Too loyal. Too proud. Damn Hellscream. His ambition tore our horde apart. Go on, find Thrall, finish this. I will live. Like he promised Garrosh and Northrend, he helped out with bringing the Warchief down, they tried to lead the Horde down a very dark path once again. His vision is not what they believe the Horde is about. Vol'jin is appointed as the new Warchief, but instead of executing Garrosh, they decided to place him on trial in Pandaria. For this trial, there had to be a defender and an accuser. Toronto Whisperwind was appointed as the accuser for the Alliance, but the Horde planned to have Bane Bloodhoof as his defender. Of course, Bane couldn't believe his ears. Garrosh was the one who'd killed his father, how could he be his defender? But even Saurfang agreed that he was the right choice. Make them listen, came a voice that had so far been quiet. It was deep, strong despite age, and a sharp thread of pain went through it. There's no challenge in flinging a list of atrocities at Garrosh's head, said Saurfang. The test will be who can make the judge and jury truly listen. To hear you speak for calm consideration when all know how you suffer. Only you, Bane Bloodhoof, you can do that. And so it was that Bane accepted this very difficult job, and during the trial, they showed visions related to Garrosh, visions from witnesses who knew him in life. Saurfang himself was questioned, and at first, Saurana planned to show the vision of his son's death at the Wrath Gates, but Bane protests, not wanting the old veteran to relive that pain. Even Taranzu agrees that Varok is a respected war hero and has undergone great loss, but he does not see how that is a bearing on the interactions with Garrosh. It's not like the Lich King's on trial here. Color rose in Tyrande's cheeks. She withdrew her request and offers apologies to the witness if it disturbed him. Instead, she went for the vision of Garrosh and Saurfang talking with each other in Northrend, the veteran warning the hothead that if he would take the Horde down a dark path once again, he would personally take him out. Bane gets to question him and asked if Saurfang believes that Garrosh did indeed take them down the dark path. The orc does, of course, which is why he took up arms against him, but surprisingly, he does not want to see Garrosh executed. Garrosh was not always as you see him now. He was, as I have said, reckless and impulsive, but I once would never have doubted his loyalty to the Hordes, and even now, I do not doubt his loyalty to his people. But 
His crimes must be addressed. I vow to kill him, and I would still uphold that vow, but I would not surrender him to others for execution. I would challenge him myself, Imda Makura. Do you think he deserves a second chance? If he defeated me, yes. That is the way of the orcs, the true way, honor. Bane could barely believe what he was hearing. I do not wish to misunderstand you, so forgive my repetition. You do not want Garrosh executed by the courts, but rather wish to challenge him in honorable combats? And if he won that combat, you would see him forgiven? He would need to earn his reputation back, given that he has ripped it to shreds and trampled it into the angry earth. Sourfang snapped. But yet, if he were a victor, then he should have that chance. He had honor once. He could learn it again. Bane could barely refrain from letting out a shout of delight. This he understood. This he could support. And moreover, it was fair. He thought of his father dying in the Makura and how Cairn would have approved and knew in his heart that he was on the proper track. Despite his anger towards Garrosh, Bane was in truth doing the right thing. He gave Tyrande a triumphant look and announced that he had no further questions. And to his surprise pleasure, neither did Tyrande. In the end, the trial itself didn't matter much for the fate of Garrosh, considering that the bronze dragon Kairos Dormu, he helped him escape and he took him back in time to an alternate reality. He and Refion had come up with the idea to have Garrosh lead a new horde, a horde that could support us against the coming legion threats. But things didn't go exactly as planned. Garrosh murdered Kairos as soon as they arrived, he made contact with the alternate version of his father, and together they formed the Iron Horde. One that did refuse the demon blood offered by Gul'dan, but also one still very keen on invading Azeroth, with the Dark Portal turning red. Alliance and Horde were called to battle once more and ventured through the Dark Portal. Garrosh would indeed find his end in Makura, not with Saurfang, but with Thrall, while Varok's role during the expansion, that was simply to show up in the Horde garrison and offer a variety of quests for the general. For a small time, they could even ask the legendary orc to join them on patrol, but that was apparently a bug and quickly hotfixed, out of fear that High Overlord Saurfang would cleave the garrison in half. Interesting to note is that we do see alternate versions of characters like Duratan, Gromash, and Orgrim, but there's no alternate version of Saurfang. Guess they wanted to give us a chance of actually winning the war against the Iron Hordes, which we did, of course. We dismantled the Iron Horde and we took away Gromash's power, which Gul'dan used to his advantage as he offered the Demon Blood once again. This time, some of the orcs did accept. They even managed to summon Archimonde into the world, and in his final moments, Archimonde sends Gul'dan over to our reality to kick off another invasion from the Legion. At the Tomb of Sagaris, he opened up a massive rift for the Legion to come through, and once more, Alliance and Horde had to team up and deal with the demonic threats. Sylvanas Windrunner and Varian Rin, they led the charge, but things didn't exactly work out. It was a death trap, waiting to be sprung. The Horde was overwhelmed, Vol'jin mortally wounded, and they were forced to retreat. The Alliance down below, they saw the Horde abandon them and were forced to do the same, but Gul'dan wasn't about to let his prey run away unharmed. Varian sacrificed himself so that the rest of them could escape, while Vol'jin's wounds ultimately took his life as well. Back in Orgrimmar, Saurfang, now war chief of the orcs and commander of the city's defenses, he lets heroes in to witness the final moments of their war chief. <laughs> War Chief. The lower spirit say death will claim me soon. In the end, death claims us all. But the Horde will live on. I have never trusted you. Nor would I have ever imagined in our darkest time that you would be the one to save us. The spirits have granted me clarity, a vision. They whisper a name. Many will not understand, but you must have part of the shadows and leave.
while some would have loved to see an orc like Saurfang become the war chief, it's the name Sylvanas that the spirits whisper to Vol'jin. Under her leadership, the Horde moves out to claim vengeance for his death, stop the Legion threats, and of course, Saurfang is right there with them. He was present, defending against the Legion invasions of the Northern Barons, but Etric notices that Saurfang is not the same ever since their loss at the Broker Shore. Though he led well and slew many, he has taken our defeat hard. Etric fears that he's determined to return to the Broker Shore, and he asks warriors to go and speak with him in Dalaran. Ah, our way to Etric sent you. His concern is noble, but unnecessary. Death is our likely end on those shores. You know this, yet I can see the determination in your eyes. Perhaps you have honor to regain there as well. Saurfang is indeed very angry, but he does not chase his own death. All he wants is to regain a bit of honor and slay the demon still drunk in the victory. We join him on his spare mount, but the Legion, they're not defenseless of course, and they shoot us out of the sky. Make them pay, champion! Make them pay! Don't worry though, it will take a little bit more to kill someone like Saurfang, as our journey takes us to the very halls of Valor, where we meet up with Odin and work on our order hall in claiming mighty artifacts to use in his war against the Legion. Master Smith Helgar is kind enough to help us with empowering the artifacts, but the Valajar is in need of inspiration. He's looking for an axe, whose forms has seen a truly astounding amount of battle, wielded by one of the most powerful warriors in the world. Both weapon and owner, forged together in the crucible of war, we need to find his hero and convince them to come to the Halls of Valor. One name, of course, immediately comes to mind. Varok Saurfang and his Arcanite Reaper. You are one of the greatest warriors that the Horde has ever fielded. Your Arcanite Reaper is feared by all your foes. I do not do what I do for praise. I am here to save Azeroth and the Horde. I sense you have a purpose here. What do you want? We tell him of Helgar's request, and Saurfang is honored that we think so highly of him. It's true, he has seen no small amount of battle, but so have we. It's time to see how far we've come, as we get the opportunity to do with him ourselves. In the circle of glory, the legendary orc shows us just what an honorable, experienced, mighty orc can do. A weapon is only as good as his wielder, as once upon a time Broxigar showed us with the Axe of Scenarius. And while Saurfang's weapon was not forged with the help of a wild god, it is still very impressive. After winning the duel, or some might say after Saurfang allows us to win, Elgar inspects both wielder and weapon together. The scratches on the blade, the wear on the haft, tell of battle stresses and where it is hit most often. See how easily you balance the heft. The comfort of your grip shows years of experience. While that can never be forged, he can improve a new weapon in the right places, so its wearer will strike more true and lives to earn those years. It shows that even a Valajar can learn from the younger races, as we earn the right to wield the Arcanite Bladebreaker. With our mighty artifacts, we stood against the might of the Legion. We even went to the world of Argus and stopped Sargeras from destroying our worlds. He was able to leave us with a little parting gift, a massive blade now rests within Silophus, and the world of Azeroth is wounded. War Chief, if I may offer a few words. It is with both pain and pride that we gather here today. Pain for many brave heroes of the Horde fell against a terrible foe. And pride for against all odds. We have vanquished the Legion. We bled. Now we heal. We mourned. Now we celebrate. For the Horde! For the Horde! <laughs> War Chief! A moment of your time. Hmm. No doubt Gallywix wants to push his latest money grubbing scheme. Rats scurry about their business. And get eaten. If they're not careful. <laughs> hmm. What is the rat up to? He 
does keep sending more goblins to Silithus. <laughs> Nothing good has ever come out of Silithus. This will change everything. <laughs> I told you! And the Alliance knows nothing of this? Don't worry, War Chief. I got people on it. And that's pretty much where we're at when it comes to Saofeng's story. He remembers the days of leading the forces in Silifus during Classic, and he does not believe that going back there is a good idea. The Horde still moves out to mine Azerite, the crystallized blood of the Titan spirit inside the world, and despite Gallywix telling his war chief not to worry about it, the Alliance, of course, discovers what the Horde is doing, and they move into Silifus as well. They too follow the trail of Azerite. Only time will tell what the story is going to bring next, but I do want to talk a little bit about the hints that we have, a little bit about the information that we know, and speculate on what might come. So if you don't want any spoilers, then this will be the time to turn off the video. For those interested, at the last BlizzCon, they handed out a short preview of the upcoming novel written by Christy Golden, which is called Before the Storm. Sylvanas Windrunner, former Ranger General Silvermoon, the Dark Lady of the Forsaken, and present War Chief of the Mighty Horde, had resented being told to come to Orgrimmar like a dog that needed to perform all of its tricks. She had wanted to return to the Undercity. She missed its shadows, its dampness, its restful quietude. Rest in peace, she fought grimly and had to smother a smile. It faded almost at once as she continued pacing impatiently in the small chamber behind the Warchief throne in Gromash Hold. A few years ago, Gerard's Hellscream had pushed to have a massive celebration in Orgrimmar to commemorate the end of the Northrend campaign. He wasn't Warchief. Not then. There had been a parade of every veteran who wished to participate. Their paths strewn with important pine boughs and a gigantic feast awaited them at the end of the route. Awards have been distributed, and the inns of the city flung open without limits to those who had fought for the hordes. It had been extravagant and expensive, and Sylvanas initially had no intention of following in the footsteps of Hellscream in not just this situation, but in any. He had been arrogant, brutal, impulsive. Sylvanas had loathed him and had secretly conspired, unsuccessfully regrettably, to kill him even after he'd been arrested and charged with his war crimes. His decision to attack Fedamore with a devastating mana bomb had to stop her races wrestling with their consciences. The only thing that had troubled Sylvanas about it had been the orc's timing. When at last, inevitably, Garrosh had been killed, Sylvanas was pleased, though she still harbored regrets that she had not been the one to take his life. Varok Saurfang, the leader of the orcs, and Bane Bloodhoof, chieftain of the Tauren, had borne no love for Garrosh either. But they pushed Sylvanas to make an appearance, and at least some kind of gesture, to mark the end of this war. Brave members of this horde, you lead, fought and died to make sure the Legion did not destroy this world, as it had so many others. The young bullet intoned. He had been but one step away from openly rebuking her. Sylvanas recalled Saurfang's thinly veiled warning. Frets, you are the leader of all the hordes. Orcs, Tauren, Trolls, Blood Elves, Goblins, as well as the Forsaken. You must never forget that, or else they might. What I will not forget, Orc, she fought, I arising in her new are those words. So from this we learn that Sylvanas has no problem with the tactics used by Garrosh, more so with the timing of it all, and Saurfang reminds her that she now leads more than just the Forsaken. She is the war chief and should be there for all of them, while at the same time her Forsaken, resurrected with free will, they feel like she left them without leaving someone behind to care for them. In response, a new organization has formed called the Desolate Council, one that does not agree with the Banshee Queen's plans of trying to stay alive forever. They don't know Know what it exactly is that they do want then. All they know is that a new faction has risen up, the disadvantage of giving them free will. 
two sides, both wanting more from her, while she herself still sees the Forsaken as her people, not the entirety of the Hordes. All the same, she must keep up appearance, as she's going to need the brave fighters of the Horde for yet another battle. This one is one that she and Nathanos have both longed for, the attack on Stormwind. That is where the preview ends, and it's my hope that the story is going to revolve around Sylvanas, starting out at the point where she didn't even want to be Warchief, right? That is where they're going to begin with, but she'll make use of the situation and use the horde as she pleases. She right now doesn't see all the races as her people, but perhaps in the events of the storyline it will teach her more about what it means to be for the horde and not just go with her old motivation of staying alive. That's just a hope though, like I said, the story hasn't been revealed yet. Now another bit of information that we learned from BlizzCon and a couple of interviews is that Teldrassil is going to be burned down by the Horde, which then leads into the Siege of Lordaeron. That sexy Battle for Azor cinematic that we have, that follows the burning of the Night Elves' home. We also have two pictures of that event. First there's a blue one, Teldrassil is still standing, and we see, presumably, Sylvanas, Nathanos and Saurfang, with an unknown elf on the ground. Weapons, a bit of flame in the forefront, presumably a battle that took place here, and the elf is not looking too good considering what's pierced in their back. The next picture then has Sylvanas standing by herself, the elf now leaning and gazing upon the destruction. The fire in the front is gone, the tree is now ablaze, while Saofeng and Nathanos, they no longer stand at the warchief's side, they possibly set sail with one of the ships. It's anyone's guess really what exactly went down here. We don't know who the elf is, why they're burning down Tail to the Sail, how they managed to do so, what kind of battle took place here. All of that is pretty much unknown. It is interesting that an orc like Saurfang is present in this critical moment since we know that he is very loyal to the Warchief. He's a proud, honorable orc loyal to the Horde, but definitely up to a certain point. When he believes that someone once again tries to take the Horde down that dark path of the past, he won't follow forever like someone like Nasgrim did. He is capable and willing to pick up arms if it's in the best interest for the Horde, and yet... Here we see him standing. Did he try to stop this moment from ever happening? Is there some sort of scheme being set up to make it look like the Horde did it? Is someone trying to manipulate events to have the Alliance and Horde in all-out conflict so that they can profit from it? So many questions. Now fast forward to the moment of the Siege of Lordaeron, where once again we see Saurfang standing with the Horde. Ours is a cycle of hatred. Alliances forged and broken. We have paid the price for sharing this world. And we have forgotten what makes us strong. Close ranks! Advance has won! Lordaeron will be ours! My king, we have her cornered.
Sylvanas! The Orc veteran is brought to his knees, but Sylvanas is able to rally the troops and in their massive charge out of the city, Anduin and Saurfang end up in battle. The son of the king that told Muradin to step down is knocked off his feet. Greymane then pushes Saurfang away and Anduin calls on the light to heal the troops and they continue their battle. Lordaeron will fall to the alliance and that's pretty much all that we know right now. Again, we see Saurfang standing with his warchief, this legendary honorable orc, respected on both sides is fighting at her side. I really, really hope that there's going to be a lot of character developments and a very solid reasoning. Azerite is what reignites the Allies and Horde conflict. That is to say, there was a bit of conflict within Stormheim and of course a bit of conflict before all of that, but considering that the conflict was just so underdeveloped during Legion, this seems to be a, a cataclysmic moment, right? Azerite, everybody's going for it, this seems to be the moment. At this point in time, we have a warchief that doesn't really care about the other races of the Hordes. She sees the Forsaken as her bulwark against the infinite, and she didn't even cheer with the other leaders. What could motivate someone like Saurfang to not join a rebellion like he did during Mr. Panaria, which is why I hope that there's going to be a lot of intrigue and betrayal. Perhaps it's Gallywix that sees his moment to make a profit. Perhaps it's Greymane that uses the opportunity to get his vengeance, which then backfires. But wait, there's even more. All of this, this script was written before Alpha was released, and with it, we learn a couple of juicy tidbits here and there about what Saurfang is doing. Keep in mind that this is either data mining information or alpha information, so all of this is not set in stone. But it appears that Saurfang, Nefanos, and Sylvanas, they are indeed on their way through Felwood, into Darkshore, preparing to squeeze Malfurion from both sides. I couldn't really find more details on the burning of Teldrassil itself, besides Sylvanas wanted to secure the continent. But at the Seeds of Lordaeron, we have Alliance and Horde going at it. Sylvanas has an Azerite machine, a war machine, which appears to be against Saurfang's way of battle, as they say, honor means nothing to a corpse, Saurfang. You have the luxury of underestimating death, but it is something with which I am intimately familiar. Maybe you don't care if your people die, so long as it's honorable. But to me, this horde is worth saving. Anyone who disagrees does not deserve to stand among us. So die your warrior's death, high overlord Saurfang. It means little to me. Perhaps I will raise your broken body to serve me once more. Or perhaps you will have a chance to say hello to your son. Again, we're working only with tidbits here, but it appears that Sylvanas will do anything, anything it takes, to hold the line against the Alliance, change the way of warfare, and secure the continent for the Horde. Now the question is, does she do that for the Horde or for her own well-being? Time will only tell, I suppose. Saurfang is defeated, demanding an honorable death. Anduin remembers how his father told him that Varok Saurfang represented what was best of the Horde. Its sense of honor. He admired the orc for it, and so does Anduin. There's no honor in slaying him in that moment, despite Saurfang thinking that that's not for an alliance king to decide, but he's captured all the same and taken to the stockades. The boy king wants his people to treat Saurfang with the respect that he is due, and when he returns, they'll speak of honor and actions. When you return, we will see. The veteran warrior replies, as I assume that the alliance goes further with the battle. They try to go after Sylvanas and the rest of the hordes, and while they do win the Siege of Lordaeron, they fail in taking a warchief, as we can see her on the alpha testing. Sylvanas is located in Gromash Hold, where she sends out heroes to find a vessel containing important information that was en route for Bladefist Bay. The ship has never arrived, and her scouts report that it was seized by the alliance and then taken to Stormwind, together with Nefanos, Rokan, Felistra, and Lassan's Skyhorn, we fly into Stormwinds to infiltrate stockades and extract the prisoners. These prisoners are Prophet Zul and Princess Talanji of the Zandalari tribe, but we also discover that Saurfang is still alive and imprisoned. Now an in-game cinematic is supposed to play out here, one that's not available quite yet, but Saurfang is not coming back with us. He'll buy us as much time as he can to complete our mission, as he tells our guards to take him to the boy king as he would have words with him. During our escape from the city, Felistra believes that the Alliance troops were waiting for us and that we've been compromised, but that's the last to be here of Saurfang for the moment. Now it's very difficult to try and piece together what exactly is happening here, since we're missing a whole lot of pieces of the puzzle. For the moment, to me, it seems like Saurfang does not agree with his Warchief's way of warfare, which landed him in prison. To speak of honor and actions, I imagine that that is what the conversation is going to be about. And from Anduin's history, we know that he was often the voice of reason when it came to peace negotiations between the Alliance and the Hordes. Will he and Saurfang be a bridge between the factions? 
maybe. I just can't imagine someone like Sour Fang actually joining Team Alliance. Unless there's something really, really bad going on within the hordes. Now my hope is that at some point, these voices of reason, they're going to have to rise up again, considering that the faction war is not the only threat in this expansion. And another little bit of extra information. A lot of people have recently been asking, what about alternate orcs joining the alliance? Now, from my point of view, that would be absolutely hilarious if Blizzard actually does that. I would be laugh my ass off, but I personally highly doubt it. The reason for that is that Battle for Azeroth is going to take us back to the Horde Alliance conflict, right? Considering that the heart of the conflict is humans versus orcs, I would be very, very surprised if the orcs actually join the alliance. But like I said, it's, it's not impossible and I would find it hilarious. I'm sure, as more things are going to be data mined and more stuff that are revealed during the Alpha Beta, during the Before the Storm novel, we'll get a clearer picture on what's going on and where they want to take him. For now though, this is where we're at with his story. An orc who has seen many battles, had to deal with the shadows of the past, has lost many things so very dear to him, yet always tries to maintain honor and stand for what it means to be part of the Horde. Honor, young heroes, no matter how dire the battle. Never forsake it! As always, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for watching everyone. Subscribe if you like my videos, leave a like if you enjoyed this one, and until next time guys, see ya!